Hey there friends, and welcome to episode 4 of my beginner's tutorial series for RimWorld. I'm Icon, and today we will dive deeper into the topic of crafting. And we are going to explore the topic of research and technology at the same moment, because I feel like these go quite good hand in hand. Last episode we figured out how to make our people happier, and we did upgrade the living areas here a little bit, but at the end of the day we're going to need more than just wooden shacks, and that's where crafting and technology will help us. One more thing here, we're quite running low on food, so what we're going to do today is on the side we're going to hunt ourselves some donkeys, or well, maybe not donkeys, let's take ibex does, the donkeys we might need later. Ibex does are really easy to hunt and yield a pretty nice amount of food. When it comes down to hunting, I will explain a lot more about this topic in the future episodes, but I want to put hunting and these things into a different topic. For now, just uh, let's just talk about the fact that these beasties are really good to hunt them as a as game. Okay. So, back to the crafting department. One of my favorite and most important things on the crafting side are stone blocks. These are made at the stonecutter's table. The stonecutter's table takes limestone chunks and other chunks and transforms them into usable cut stones. So, we are storing all our stones over here, so it might be a good idea to make sure that the spot where we are working for these not too far away. Because it's always quite good when your workbench is near to the actual resources you're working with. So in this scenario, I'm going to drop down the stonecutter's table, as a matter of fact, inside here. We're not going to use a steel one, steel in one, we're going to make it out of wood. As you might notice here, some items have fixed costs, like the stonecutter's table always needs a portion of steel because, yeah, you can't cut stones without steel, I guess. Okay, so one thing worth mentioning about workbenches here is it is always better to put them inside rooms because the work efficiency of your workbenches will be worse if they don't stand inside a room. If you are interested about your work efficiency, you can always check out the work speed factor here when you check out the information screen of the table. As we see here, our butcher table has a set only a 70% work speed factor because it's too cold in there, which is something I accept because this way our people might be working slower while they're doing their butchering job, but at least they don't need to walk 100 miles to get to their butchering job. <laughs> Okay, so with the stone cutters table now done, we're going to check out the builds which we can create here. The stone cutters table is where we create blocks. As you see here, blocks for every type and the make any stone blocks uh, command. The men any stone block command, let's check into, check into the details. As you see here, just tries to take whatever chunk and cut it down. You can configure that, like if you know that there's only limestone and granite there, or you have all manner of different chunks and you only want two types of those, that's what you can use this menu for, for example. I'm going to play through a lot of different things which you can do with this configuration system here during this episode, so don't you worry. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to reduce the ingredient radius again to make sure that this white border here is definitely inside the, is only soaking in the chunks which we have here because otherwise your people will run around over the map and try to get everything. So I'm going to do this one forever. This will try to cut away all the stone blocks which are in the yard here. What I really do like to do at the same moment is to tell the game that we're going to store these stone blocks all here. So as we see here in the raw resources tab, we can activate the stone blocks. Let's call that a preferred spot, just like we did with the 
refrigerator in the last episode to make sure that the people which cut those stones will put the stone blocks outside. There are a couple of materials which won't ever deteriorate outside. I introduced the deterioration system quite at the beginning of the series. And another thing, for example, is steel. We enabled steel now, so now I can tell bubbles to hold that because there is a better place for the steel to be at. And as you see here, the steel has also no deterioration outside. So this means basically you can easily store your steel in, uh, outside of the buildings. Meanwhile, let's check out how the hunting goes. Not too well, I see. So this one is bleeding to death soon. The other one is not. Hunting is a very good uh, way to train the shooting skills of your colonists, by the way. The worst shooters can be made into good shots by just letting them hunt long enough. Okay, so now we have these things settled down. We're now going to set up another line of production and that's going to be tailoring. That's where we create clothing and it's insanely important to put that up at some point early on. You can either go for a hand tailoring bench or an electric tailoring bench. The difference between these two is that hand tailoring takes way longer and electric is double as fast. Good thing about the electric tailor bench is that if you happen to have no power for it, you can still use it just like you can use the hand tailoring bench. Long story short, only use the hand tailoring bench if you really, really are short on resources or anything. Otherwise, the electric tailoring bench is always just an upgrade towards the other one. Okay. So we still need to wait for our people to cut some more trees. Bubbles has now an Ibex dough available for herself. And as we see here, this creates a yummy amount of rations for us. Hunting on the side is one of the most easy and comfortable ways to achieve to acquire food in the in the game in general because there's on most maps and most biomes a steady supply of animals which you can live off but more of that more of that in another another in a, another tutorial so who was again my plant cutter that was pi pi has to go for a night shift today because we need wood you can always command your people to work whenever you want them to. You can just select them and shake them out of their night's, uh, night's rest. There's one thing worth mentioning though. The lower their needs here drop, the more unhappy they grow. And of course, they will, will, they will go resting on another time if you don't uh, let them rest at night. So basically, if you stress out somebody at night, night, night too long, he will automatically, if he has the anything command in the schedule, use that to sleep if he's too tired, which is quite useful. This way, with the automatic schedule here, you can, or the default schedule, you can just uh, force your people to work whenever you want it to, and they'll recover when when it's necessary. So don't be shy to force things which you deem very important. Okay, just like this electric tailoring bench. As you notice here, we're also slowly running out of power here. So our generator is yielding less and less power. The tailor bench needs 120 watt too. So sooner or later, we will need more power, but more about that in a minute. So now we got the tailoring bench. As you see here, the menu for crafting, like I mentioned in the last episode, is always pretty much the same. We can create all manner of different clothing uh, slots here. And what I want to introduce here is the fact that your people have different clothing slots, <laughs> which is important to know. So sadly, the base game doesn't tell you enough about that, but there are layers here, layer, skin, covers, left leg and right leg. So basically, well, most of these things go just by uh, common sense. So you can wear one hat, you can wear one pair of pants, you can wear one button down t-shirt. But what doesn't come to intuitively is, for example, tribal wear is always a pants and a t-shirt at the same time. 
because if you check it out more closely, it covers the torso and the left leg and the right leg. So some clothing behaves a little bit uh, different. And I did mention the layers because if you check out stuff like dusters, it has the so-called outer layer because it's a jacket. And that means you have a skin layer and you have an outer layer. And even if you wear something which to uh, covers your torso and whatever on the skin layer, you can still put something on top of that on the outer layer. It's a little bit obscure, but I think it makes perfect sense. I mean, you can wear a jacket over your clothing, can't you? But you can't wear another t-shirt over your t-shirt. Or, well, you could, but the game doesn't allow you to. <laughs> So, as we see here, it's getting closer to spring, uh, to summer, and at some point there will be winter. So, what's really important early on in the crafting department is that you get into crafting of jackets for your people and hats. Because as you see here, the standard equipment here is already a pair of pants and a shirt, so they don't really need more than that but the hats and the jackets will protect from temperatures really good. So for now, we're going to create ourselves new cowboy hats, two of them, because Emmanuel is already wearing a steel helmet and everybody will receive a jacket. There's three types of uh, jackets in this game, jackets, dusters, and parkas. And it goes like this. Dusters are really good against hot weather, so they insulate better against heat than against cold. The parka is the exact opposite. It's insulating way better against cold and has practically no insulation against heat. So the parka doesn't really protect you from heat, it keeps you warm. And then there's last but not least the jacket which is kind of a uh, middle field between the duster and the parka. So if you are living in a really hot biome, the duster is way to go. And if you're living in a cold biome, the parkas are way to go. And the, ja jack the jackets are ideal for anything in between. Since we are living in a temperate forest biome, I want some jackets for these people. Another thing worth mentioning here is that you see these Items also feature armor ratings because a jacket does armor you to some degree. The Rimworld armor system is a little bit obscure and it was pretty difficult for me to understand, but only at the first glance. Rimworld has sharp, blunt, and heat damage. All manner of guns are sharp damage, if I remember correctly at least. Mm. And yeah, it must be sharp damage. Blunt damage is everything like uh, thrown weapons like rocks or clubs or hammers. And heat damage is obviously fire. So what that means, a high sharp armor protects really good from bullets and arrows. A high blunt armor protects good from blunt weapons. And high heat armor reduces your impact from, from heat attacks, fire attacks basically. What that means is boiled down practical clothing like parkas, dusters, t-shirts and pants are better at protecting you from temperatures and clothing like flak helmets, flak vests and flak pants are rather bad at insulating you. Check out the flak vest here, which uh, has practically no insulation, but a really, really good armor. And the overall armor is always a, an average of your total armor slots. So basically, this is only a rough average on how good your character is protected, because at the end of the day, every bullet hits a certain part of your body. And even though the overall armor here is stated like that, if a bullet would hit Emmanuel's head, it will still use the stats from the flak helmet and not the stats from the overall armor just wanted to point that out because I felt like the game doesn't give you away this information too clearly. But back to our uh, tailoring bench. We have now decided that we're going to do these things. And in the detail settings, as you can see here, we can now define which materials shall be used. 
as you see we need 70 ingredients and here goes the work amount and we can now define that we want to have the settings which we which we already know i want to introduce one neat setting here and that's the allowed crafting skill with this way you can keep your low crafting people away from this job and keep this job available for high crafting skill people because the problem is the higher your crafting skill the higher the result of your item and quality on items really does a terrible amount of a change like poor quality versus excellent or even legendary quality it always behaves like two different items so Take that seriously and try to keep your people crafting with the highest stats. But we, with these configurations here, well, let's uh, put Iman Wheel on a higher priority. We can make sure that only the best people get to do it, or you can just assign that job to a certain person. My personal approach is I to assign to certain people if I only want to make sure that this batch has been created by the best one. And this one, this setting here, I only use if I have several crafters in the colony and I want to make sure that a certain project is not by accident being used as a as a training job for some for some inadequate talented people. Okay, enough about that. I think you guys understood how the crafting of clothing at this point worked. We're going to get back to Emmanuel and force him to work a little bit with us because, you know, hunting is something he can do at another point. So Emmanuel will now grab the leathers and start crafting here. You see there's a amount of work left. And at the end of this, there's a hat. It's normal quality and then he will continue to do this until the job here is done. He will always check to use the leathers here in the list and I can highly recommend if you want to use different materials or a specific material, configure it here accordingly. But what does all the, what's all the fuss about materials? I'm going to show you. Materials are going to influence the outcome of your items tremendously. So let's get into the cowboy hat. As you see here, we were using, wait, give me a sec. I just, uh, we were using light leather. So let's check this out. Here we can change the material we used. So a light leather cowboy hat. So the game now just spits out the stats for a light leather cowboy hat. Insulation against heat 6 degree and insulation against cold 1.2 degree. Armor ratings, well, I can't really keep them all, but let's just stick with the insulation stats and get back to or swap over to a Muffalo wool cowboy hat. As you see here, the cold insulation has tremendously changed and the other stats were quite much th much the same. If we get back to Synthread, we have different stats and so on and so forth. So basically every material yields different stats. If you check out the material itself, you always get a readout about its uh, certain statistics. Well, what can I say? In this game, you will learn your leathers sooner or later because every type of leather has certain qualities, but to give you a quick rundown, it's just mostly common sense. I mean, wools are good against uh, cold. Lots of uh, stuff like camel hides or other lighter leathers are good against heat. Cloth is in general a good uh, all-rounder. And there's ex more exclusive leathers like or, or materials like, uh, for example, mega sloth wool, which most often yield really specific, uh, spe special traits. I can't summarize this too easily because this is one of the most deep and complex uh, things the game has to offer, but I can only say experiment around with it and have fun. That's the best way of dealing with it. So you will learn all the necessary things along the way. And to give you a easy rule of thumb, as long as your people are equipped during the extreme seasons with at least a duster for the summer and a cowboy hat or duster and cowboy hat, pants and shirt for the real hot environments and the same stuff, just a parka and a toque as 
headgear and you're well off in all different scenarios. Usually. It's not really that hard. The materials used are practically only an icing on the cake. The icing on the cake. As you see here now, Emmanuel is heading over and is cutting some stones. By the way, cutting stones runs over the crafting job. Smithing, well, we can't smith anything right now. And tailoring are different jobs. One thing really worth mentioning, cutting stones doesn't train your crafting skill. Only crafting items actually trains that, so you can passively train up your people with that. Okay, what did we miss here? There's the art bench. We're going to talk about the art bench too, because that's art, uh, that's crafting as well. And last but not least, we're going to introduce the smelter, which is a recycling bench, basically. At the smelter, we create new steel out of old steel, basically. The smelter is able to process those steel select chunks back into steel, just like the stonecutter's table is able to process these chunks into stone blocks. The electric smelter though is a very hungry thing, needing 700 watt, and since we are pretty much out of power, we need to devise new methods of gaining power. And that's where we're going to start talking about technology. So technology can be gained by doing research at a simple research bench. So let's check out who was my scientist. Pi. So we're going to put this table into Pi's room. How you organize these things is entirely up to you, of course. You can create a own scientists lab for these things or you can create a own storage zone for the tailoring area how you organize these things i leave that entirely up to you the art bench by the way cr uh, creates sculptures i'm going to create one sculpture here just for the love of it these are being made by this job so we're going to let bubbles craft one sculpture i'm going to talk about the sculpture in between the lines when we when we get there sculptures can be made out of all different materials stone valuable materials steel or wood i'm going to x out steel because i don't want that uh, steel is being used for this job because it's too valuable so the electric smelter we're going to designate toggle power off so we're going to flick switch on that because we are not going to try to do this as you see here pi is now harvesting the rice as well wonderful but i get sidetracked i wanted to talk about the research next research is opening up the access to this tech tree as you see here there's this is a diagram being which has to be read from left to right Tree sewing technology leads to cocoa technology, smithing leads to machining, and so on and so forth. I'd say it's pretty easy and directly understandable. The number here is basically the research cost, which translates into work units, just like we had it with the uh, crafting of items. It's just a attempt to measure what amount of time is necessary. Here we have a description and we see what the things unlock. Smithing would be quite appealing, but I want to research batteries first. Batteries store electricity, and with the battery technology, we can counteract the unreliability of the wind turbine. Because if we have a battery which starts to store all the power when the wind is blowing fiercely, and releases that power when there is no wind at all, wind power turns into a really reliable and valuable power source. So, but how do we research? As we see here, Pi is going to be a person which has to do that, and there's a research job. I'll highly prioritize this now, and now you cannot prioritize researching. This is quite horrible, but that's just how it is. What you have to do is you better build a cozy stool in, top of, um, in front of that thing, and then you have to make sure that the work schedule of your people is enabling your is enabling that person to do science. As you see here now, Pi is being distracted by the hunting job and won't be able to do research. So to avoid that, I'm going to 
disable hunting's priority on Pi. And now Pi will only go for plant jobs and then go to research. I really like to do research on people which are either busy with agriculture or cooking. Basically every person which has jobs that have a clear window of time which is over at some point, like growing and plant cutting. When the job is done, the job is done, then they have practically nothing to do and they can sit down and research all the time. So as you see here, Pi is now done with this work and now he's going to flick those papers. The other way around uh, with the cooks is the logic behind that. When you're my colonies are always configured that they only need a certain amount of meals and they butcher away all the remaining animals and once that's done the cook is not busy anymore. You can do that what, however you want to, it's up, entirely up to you, but at the end of the day it's really important to, make, to do research. Let's summarize that one more time. You need to make sure that the work schedule of your researcher is configured in a way that they automatically go there often enough. Okay, so that's that. We're going to need a little bit more wood to make that happen. And as you saw here, the points here were moving forward while Pi was researching. Research is a work which requires certain things. So research speed is influenced by the room's cleanliness and also by the room's light and, well, by the intellectual skill of the researcher. And that's pretty much all that's uh, up to, that's all how you research. Research is the way in the game to unlock all manner of wonderful things and it's really important that you do it. At the beginning, I, I highly recommend battery technology because this unlocks, like I said, a easier usability of wind power and solar panels accompany, make a good company to batteries and wind turbines. There's also a third method of gaining energy and that's geothermal power, which just builds generators on top of these steam geysers and it's a permanent cost-free complication-free power source but because there's uh, a lot of uh, issue-free things uh, attached to it it's a quite costly technology as you see here okay we're not going to see this one the last time we're going to just leave it with that and wait until Pi has finally discovered the battery technology for us. So meanwhile Bubbles is going to get crazy on the statue. There's enough stone for her to get there and now she's going to do the sculpture. Sculptures are basically going to be pieces of furniture like the table and the stool and the beds which you can install in the rooms and they do basically two things. They increase the beauty of a room by, well, a certain level according to the quality of the sculpture and they offer another relaxation or um, what's it called again? Recreation type. Looking at art is a, sort, is a form of recreation for your colonists. So creating art is also a really good way of increasing the quality of life in your colony. But you needed to do crafting for that, so I didn't want to emphasize that in the last episode too much. Okay, I think we are pretty much done with the topic here so far. Let's see, did I miss something? There's of course at the end of this also the crematorium which is just good for burning stuff, but it's a really good way of getting rid of all those pesky raiders at some point. And there's the nutrient paste dispenser. The nutrient paste dispenser is your godsend if you are completely incapable of cooking in your colony and you just need food. I did an entire tutorial about the nutrient paste dispenser, but I want to just sum it up. You, you build it up, and then you can get your people have 
then your people can have food from that. They will only go there if there's no better food whatsoever available and they will get a mood to debuff from eating that because it's just gross. But beyond that, we haven't researched more production types yet. There's also the crafting spot, which should, well, I should mention the crafting spot too. It has deser it deserves a honorable mention because when you start out with a tribal gameplay, this is where you do your first things. At the crafting spot, you can make smoke leaf joints, you can make clubs, knives, short bows, and the most important thing, the crafting spot doesn't cost you anything. You can just put it up but keep in mind the work speed factor of this thing is catastrophic and basically everything you can do here you can do somewhere else better tribal wear can be done at the tailoring uh, table with a better work efficiency the smoke leaf joints can later be done at the drug table with a much higher efficiency so the crafting spot really is just a intermediate thing if you're lacking the resources to get going or the technology. On top of that, there's also the butcher spot, and it's just the same thing, like the butcher table. It doesn't cost you anything, but as you see here, it only yields 70% of the meat and leather of each creature, so you should really not use that if you don't have to. But at the end of the day, it is also a method of removing of getting meat onto the table if you don't have the butcher spot. There's one last thing which I want to introduce here and that's campfires because I feel like they are quite they, they deserve a honorable mention here. So let's harvest some wood to get that going. Here we go. The campfire also has a bill system and you can cook meals here, like I mentioned in an episode or two ago, but you can also burn things here on the campfire, which you don't want to have anymore. Drugs, for example, if you have people who are suffering from chemical fascination and you have really, really highly addictive drugs, you can get rid of them on a campfire without needing a crematorium first. You can also burn filthy clothing and uh, weapons on the campfire. And also worth mentioning, the campfire is also a gathering spot. Gathering spots mark places where people will come to party, to celebrate marriages, or just to hang out and relax socially. Okay, so I think we had a great episode about to crafting and research and well the topic ain't over here at this point as you see there's so much stuff which you can research and there's so many items which you can craft and we only scraped the surface of that there is beer brewing which features a completely unique crafting process there's drug production which is kind of like unique too we're going to cover up these things along the way but this episode gave you the fundamentals to understand how every crafting process in this game works one last thing i did forget to mention here ha huh, that's uh when you want to create a certain amount of stone blocks i really want to introduce that that you you don't have to click like that you can also hold down control or shift shift for thousands control for hundreds well as you see here this can be really easy because you can't really type in a number here you can type in a number here but if you want to have a short way of doing that hold down control for smaller steps hold down shift for, for bigger steps okay that's that next episode we're going to talk about quests because we have the Hunted Baron open, which will also enable the royalty content. Since I do this tutorial run with the royalty DLC on top of that, I'm of course going to explain this royalty topic as well. And I think this will be a part of the next episode too. Okay, so hope you guys found that all enjoyable. If there are any questions left, just please ask away. And if there are any topics which you might want to see covered in this series, just give me a Give me a line and I'll see what I can do. Leave a thumbs up on that video if you liked it. And of course, feel free to subscribe to this channel and turn on those notifications. I do daily content, so you might want to check this out. 
Also, speaking about checking things out, down there in the description box, there's my Twitch channel. I'd be more than happy to see you guys around there. And last but not least, check out the support links down there, be that Patreon, Coffee, or whatever hits your spot. If you might want to check them out, I'd be super happy. But don't you worry if you don't. Let me thank you one more time for watching. That's the most important thing for me. See you guys soon. Bye-bye.